section 6.5, the conservation of mechanical energy. So we're going to go back to our work energy theorem, that the work done by non-conservative forces is equal to the change in kinetic energy plus the change in potential energy. And we can write out those changes as in energy, those deltas, as Ke final minus Ke initial. Delta always corresponds to final minus initial. Same thing for with potential energy. Final potential energy minus initial potential energy. We could also then regroup them slightly, noticing that the initials are both negative and the final energies are both positive. We could put the final ones together, add them up, and then subtract the initial ones added together. So the negative would distribute to both of these. So it's the same expression, just rearranged slightly. And this introduces the new possible definition that of total mechanical energy, E, being kinetic energy plus potential energy. So we could rewrite our work energy theorem as the work done by non-conservative forces is equal to the final energy minus the initial energy. And it's a little more compact. Where this becomes really interesting and especially powerful is if you can identify that the net work on an object by non-conservative forces is zero, then the energy does not change. So if W and C is equal to zero, then we would add the initial energy to the other side and we'd see that the final total energy is equal to the initial energy because there's nothing to change the total energy in the system. This is the basis of the conservation of mechanical energy. It's one of the big ideas in physics. The principle of the conservation of mechanical energy says that the total mechanical energy, kinetic energy plus potential energy, of an object remains constant as the object moves, provided that the network done by external non-conservative forces is zero. We can keep our total mechanical energy constant. That means we can solve so many problems. At any given instant, we can figure out how much of what type of energy there is. So here's an example with a bobsled. Should we make a peep? We have a bobsled team, right? So at the top of the hill, it's not moving, has zero velocity, so there's no kinetic energy. It's entirely potential energy. And the total mechanical energy, kinetic plus potential, is that same 600,000. As it starts to go down the slope, though, it gives up some of its height, some of its potential energy. So the potential energy reduces. It simultaneously starts to pick up speed and gain kinetic energy. Those two together add up to the same total mechanical energy. And the same thing at a lower point, right? Less height, but more, so less kinetic potential energy, but more speed, so more kinetic energy. The same total energy. And then at the very bottom of the hill, the height is entirely gone, so the potential energy is zero, and it is moving its very fastest. All of that potential energy at the beginning has converted into kinetic energy at the bottom, while the total energy remained constant. So oftentimes what we'll do with these problems is we'll compare at the top when we have all potential energy, and then it becomes all kinetic energy at the bottom, assuming that our total mechanical energy is constant, assuming that we have conservation of mechanical energy, we can just set those two equal to each other. And this is a really great problem solving method. If you know the height, you can figure out the speed at the bottom of the hill, regardless of the path in between, right? This is kind of a wiggly path, but it's frictionless. And so our mechanical energy is conserved, which is really great. Let's look at another example of this with a daredevil motorcyclist. So the motorcyclist is trying to leap across the canyon by driving horizontally off a cliff at 38 meters per second. Ignoring air resistance, find the speed with which the cycle strikes the ground on the other side. Now this could have been a kinematics problem in that we could figure out how far the motorcycle goes, right? Or even perhaps how fast it's going to strike the other side. But here we're going to just be able to consider it using our conservation of mechanical energy. And the reason we can do that is because the problem outright says that we can ignore air resistance. And once that motorcycle is traveling through the air, for ignoring air resistance, the only force acting on the motorcycle is the force of gravity, which is a conservative force. Since it's a conservative force, we can use our conservation 
of mechanical energy. And we'll compare the point at the beginning to the point at the end. When the cycle, when it says strikes the ground, that's the speed just before it is hitting the ground, right? The speed that it is just starting to impact the ground with, which is going to be the largest speed possible. It's only after it fully impacts the ground and collides with it that it would eventually come to a stop or have a different speed. But striking the ground is gonna be the speed from the air yet again. So let's see how we can use that conservation of mechanical energy in practice. So we're going to say the final energy is equal to the initial energy, right? And so then we can plug in final energy is potential energy, mgh final, plus final kinetic energy, one half mv final squared. And the same things with the initial quantities, the initial height, the initial speed. But before we start plugging in numbers, in this case, it actually helps us to solve it in terms of the variables first. One thing we can notice is that this conservation of energy equation, every single term has mass in it. That means we can divide the mass out. And that's really useful to us because it didn't give us the mass of the writer. So because we have mass in all of the terms, they will all divide out. And we're left with a simpler expression that doesn't have mass. We can take it further though and solve for this final velocity, Vf, that it strikes the other side with. So to do that, we're going to want to subtract the g hf to the other side and then multiply by two and take the square root. And we'll be there. So we've subtracted the hf, the ghf to the other side. We pulled the g out. We multiplied both sides by two. So the one half in front of the v0 cancels and the two is left in front of the gh, not minus ho, f. And then we take the square root so that we have the final speed. So then if we plug in our knowns, two times our standard 9.8 meters per second squared times the difference in height, right, which is going to be 70 minus 35. I wish they had chosen numbers that uh, didn't have a difference that was equal to one of them. But that is what they did here is they took 70 minus 35 meters, which comes to 35 meters, plus the initial speed, 38 meters per second squared, and that comes out to a final speed of 46.2 meters per second. Does this make sense? Well, let's check. It's a higher speed than the initial speed. Should it be a higher speed than the initial? Well, we can think about, okay, we have get lost potential energy. That potential energy has become kinetic energy. So it is reasonable that the motorcycle would be traveling faster overall at this lower point because it has more kinetic energy, less potential energy. All right. One more example, this one's a conceptual one. The favorite swimming hole. The person starts from rest with the rope held in the horizontal position, swings downward, and then lets go of the rope. Three forces act on him. His weight, the tension in the rope, and the forces of air resistance. Can the principle of conservation of energy be used to calculate his final speed? So I would like you to think about this. Think about the reasoning behind your answer of yes or no, and Settle on that before you move on. So go ahead and pause the video now. All right, did you do that? Okay, so first off, we can look at each of these, right? The weight. Based on the weight being a force that acts on him, is the principle of conservation of energy going to be okay? I'm gonna say yes, why? Because it's a conservative force. Cool, the other two forces we have tension and then air resistance. These ones we know are non-conservative forces, right? So does that mean that we uh, can't use the conservation of energy? Possibly. So let's take a look at it. We know that the velocity is going uh, along this arced path and the tension is going inward towards the center. In that instance, because his path is nowhere along uh, in the direction of the tension, the work done by the non-conservative force of tension is actually zero. 
because the tension is always perpendicular to the motion. We have that angle of 90 degrees, so the work comes to zero. What about the air resistance though? What direction would that be acting on? Well, the air resistance is gonna be acting opposite the motion, right? That's a force that is opposing the motion. So what angle would that be relative to the displacement or the velocity? It's gonna be 180. So in that case, the work done by this non-conservative force of air is not zero. If that work done by non-conservative force is not zero, then we cannot use the principle of conservation of energy to calculate the final speed. Darn. We can potentially use our work energy theorem if the problem gives us how much work is done by this uh, air resistance, right? Or the amount of force by the air resistance. And we'll see an example of that in the next section. So all is not lost. Stay tuned to find out more.